Immediately following the attacks of September 11, 2001, President George W. Bush promised Americans that he would exact revenge on those who would dare attack the empire. W's program of shock and awe gave the American public an upfront look at what the U.S. military was prepared to do to the enemies of freedom and democracy. Light them all up. Come on, fire! Hey, Roger. Keep shooting. On September the 11th, enemies of freedom committed an act of war against our country. The bombing of Iraq was only the beginning of a larger conflict that the Bush administration dubbed the War on Terror. Our war on terror begins with Al-Qaeda, but it does not end there. It will not end until every terrorist group of global reach has been found stopped and defeated. The war on terror did not end in the physical battlefield, however. The U.S. government was determined to root out all possible terrorist activity and in the process, roll back as many of America's hard-earned liberties as possible. Only 45 days after the 9-11 attacks, the U.S. Congress passed the infamous USA Patriot Act. Congress passes a sweeping new anti-terrorism bill as the international hunt continues for the terrorists known simply as the Patriot Act. The full Orwellian title is the Uniting and Strengthening America by Providing Appropriate Tools Required to Intercept and Obstruct Terrorism Act. On October 26, 2001, President George W. Bush signed the Patriot Act, which gave law enforcement broader authority to investigate and prosecute suspected terrorists. The Patriot Act dramatically expanded the U.S. government's abilities to monitor emails and landline phone calls and allowed access to voicemail through a search warrant rather than through a traditional wiretap order. Today we take an essential step in defeating terrorism. For the first time, U.S. government agencies could justify gathering any and all information on its enemies. When we examine the state of civil liberties in America in 2018, what we see is the advancing tyranny of information gathering that has come directly from the Patriot Act and the security-related bills which preceded and followed it. The bulk of Americans' communications are now scanned, monitored, stored in a database, and analyzed for signs of terrorism. The NSA has even built a giant database in Utah to handle all of this data. Big Brother and Big Sister are listening through an array of devices. If you're trying to remain unmonitored, this is what you're up against in modern America. Cell site simulators, a.k.a. stingrays. A stingray acts like a cell tower decoy. In what's called a man-in-the-middle attack, it tricks cell phones into thinking it's the nearest cell tower, phones connect to the stingray, and police can access a range of personal information. But they don't just get intel on one phone. Every phone nearby is forced to divert to the stingray. Calls are passed on to a real cell tower. Data scooped up stays with police. Automatic license plate readers, audio recording devices, aka gunshot detectors, click on that. Hidden cameras and microphones in public, thermal imaging planes and drones. We now know that all this technology is used to collect data about you at all times. We know that the surveillance landscape today far exceeds even the limitations of the original Patriot Act. The Patriot Act was the catalyst for the national security tech complex to do what it does today. Whether or not it was the original intention, the Patriot Act paved the way for the government to gather all of your data without your consent constantly across all devices, whether you are connected to a so-called terrorist activity or not. The Patriot Act is the foundational legislation upon which the military industrial complex has built legal justification for direct cooperation between government employees, directors of private tech and intelligence companies and military officials. The acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals, so that security and liberty may prosper together. There are many other steps taken by the U.S. government and their misguided war on terror, which erode away at the civil liberties Americans were once afforded. 
The Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, known as DARPA, is the government agency responsible for all of the exciting and terrifying emerging military technologies. Dynetics is developing Gremlin's technology for DARPA to shape the future of unmanned airborne operations. The warfighter is increasingly counting on unmanned systems in contested environments to counter the rise of threat technologies. Gremlins is here to address these demands. In January 2002, DARPA established the Information Awareness Office, an agency with a logo featuring a pyramid with an all-seeing eye looking over the world with the motto, Scientia es potentia, or knowledge is power. The creation of the Information Awareness Office brought together several DARPA projects that focused on using surveillance and data mining to track and monitor terrorists and other threats to U.S. national security. In November 2002, the New York Times reported that DARPA was developing a classified tracking program called Total Information Awareness, or TIA. It was intended to detect terrorists by studying millions of pieces of data. The program was designed to create huge databases to gather and store personal data from emails, social media, credit card records, phone calls, medical history, and online history without the need for a search warrant. The Electronic Privacy Information Center says the goal of Total Information Awareness was, quote, to track individuals through collecting as much information about them as possible and using computer algorithms and human analysis to detect potential activity. The man behind TIA was Vice Admiral John M. Poindexter, who was the National Security Advisor in the Reagan administration, who was convicted in 1990 for his role in the Iran-Contra scandal. Poindexter's conviction would later be overturned by a federal appeals court because he was granted immunity in exchange for testifying about his wrongdoing. Poindexter later argued that the U.S. government must be granted even more powers than were given in the original Patriot Act. Public criticism of the TIA program would grow so loud that Congress was actually forced to defund the Total Information Awareness Program and the entire Information Awareness Office in 2003. Or so they thought. Despite the defunding, many Americans suspected that the programs were still being developed only under different names using different agencies. This fact would later be confirmed by Edward Snowden's leaks of 2013. For those paying close attention, however, it was known for at least seven years before the Snowden leaks that the government was looking for ways to gather as much data on everyone as possible. In 2003, lawmakers voted to shut down Total Information Awareness, a program that developed technologies to predict terrorist attacks by mining government databases and the personal records of people in the United States. The program was halted primarily because of privacy concerns, but also because its main advocate was John Poindexter, known for his involvement with the Iran-Contra scandal of the 1980s. It now appears the project was stopped in name only, and that TIA is in fact continuing. The National Journal reports TIA was moved from the Pentagon's Research and Development Agency, known by its acronym DARPA, to another group which builds technologies primarily for the NSA. The names of key projects were changed, apparently to conceal their identities, but their funding remains intact, often under the same contracts. In 2002, a consulting firm called Hicks & Associates, reportedly run by former defense and military officials, was awarded a $19 million contract to build a prototype for TIA. Finally, in 2013, even the magazine Scientific American was forced to acknowledge that the Total Information Awareness Program never ended. Edward Snowden had made it perfectly clear by that point that Americans are now living in a surveillance state. One guy sitting in front of a monitor can track with precision an unimaginably large number of people. For the first time in human history, it's both technologically and financially feasible for governments to track and store nearly complete records of our private lives. Unfortunately, the Patriot Act and Total Information Awareness were not the only attempts to strip away Americans' rights in the name of fighting terrorism. You might have never heard of the Patriot Act too, but in the years following the 9-11 attacks, it was synonymous with an attempt by the Bush administration to seize even more tyrannical powers. In February 2003, the Center for Public Integrity obtained a draft of unreleased legislation by the staff of John Ashcroft, who was the Attorney General at the time. The Draft Act was known as the Domestic Security Enhancement Act of 2003, or the Patriot Act II as it became known. At the time of the release of the text, the bill had reportedly only been seen by a handful of people. The draft of the bill was immediately criticized as an expansion of the already invasive powers granted to the Bush administration in the first Patriot Act. The American Civil Liberties Union outlined some of the most egregious changes proposed in the Patriot Act II. For example, 
Section 301 to 306 would have created a terrorist identification database, a DNA database for suspected terrorists. A few of the other changes proposed by the Domestic Security Enhancement Act of 2003 include 1. The government would no longer be required to disclose the identity of anyone, even an American citizen, detained in connection with a terrorist investigation until criminal charges are filed, no matter how long that takes. 2. Current court limits on police spying on religious and political activity would be repealed. 3. The government would be allowed to obtain credit records and library records without a warrant. 4. Americans could be extradited, searched, and wiretapped at the behest of foreign nations, whether or not current treaties allow it. 5. Lawful immigrants would be stripped of their right to a fair deportation hearing and federal courts would not be allowed to review immigration rulings. Now, I know you're hearing this and probably thinking, well, surely those are legitimate acts to take against a terrorist. Those laws would never be used against me. But you have to stop and consider the fact that the U.S. government is the one that gets to define what exactly terrorism is and what exactly terrorist activity is. Do not move. Put your hands behind your back. Stay Cuff. on your stomach. Cuff. 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 Flex. Flex. In addition, if their aim is truly to fight terror, why would they be keeping this secret from the public? At the time, the Washington Times noted, Democrats said the strategy was to sneak the elements of the bill through Congress without presenting it as the next installment of the Patriot Act. So that's what they did. Instead of trying to pass the act as a standalone piece of legislation, most of the provisions were snuck into other bills that were guaranteed to pass. One provision of the Patriot Act II that was quickly adopted under a different name has to do with a government tool known as National Security Letters. The Patriot Act vastly increased the use of national security letters, a tool that is used by the federal government which allows them to force telecommunications companies to give customer information without the use of a warrant or a judge. The national security letters are typically issued by the FBI to gather information from companies when related to national security investigations. This information can include customer names, addresses, phone and internet records, and banking and credit card statements. The NSO also requires employees who have been questioned to be silenced via a gag order, which prevents them from notifying anyone that the government is invading customers' privacy. In November 2003, Congress voted in favor of an intelligence bill which expanded the use of national security letters by redefining the term financial institution. This allowed the U.S. government to issue national security letters and subsequent gag orders to insurance companies, real estate agents, the U.S. post office, travel agencies, casinos, pawn shops, car dealers, and other businesses whose, quote, cash transactions have a high degree of usefulness in criminal, tax, or regulatory matters. One of the darkest elements of the Patriot Act, too, was codified into law in 2011 when President Obama signed the National Defense Authorization Act. The NDA 2012 included provisions which allowed the indefinite detention of American citizens without trial or charge in language very similar to the Second Patriot Act. Indeed, much of the plans of the Patriot Act are now common activities of local, state, and federal law enforcement. The bulk of American communications are now scanned, monitored, stored in a database, and analyzed for signs of terrorism. There is one more element of the surveillance landscape that we have not yet explored. The government is not the only player in the surveillance industry. Private companies also produce surveillance technology and sell it to law enforcement and government agencies, including the Harris Corps with Stingray cell phone surveillance tools, Vigilant Solutions with their massive network of automatic license plate reader cameras, L3 Communications who produce everything from police body cameras to the device that can see through walls, Geofedia's social media monitoring, online surveillance from Palantir and Media Sonar, and so on. But there is also another player in the surveillance state, social media. And online companies like Facebook are tracking our activities and collecting information. Every day, millions of people around the world voluntarily sign away their privacy and liberty when they download the latest trendy app or game without reading the terms of service. These agreements often give these private companies access to your camera, your contacts, your images, etc. We must take an honest assessment and ask ourselves, if we truly value privacy, and if we do, does keeping that privacy matter more to you than downloading that new app or game? Millions more are volunteering their information, including likes, dislikes, location, relationship status, fears, hopes, frustrations, and personal secrets by using social media platforms, namely Facebook and Instagram. Most concerning is the possibility that Facebook executives may have had close ties to CIA venture capital firm Incutel. Publicly, Incutel markets itself as an innovative way to leverage the power of the private sector by identifying key emerging technologies and providing companies with the funding to bring those technologies to market. 
In reality, however, what InQtel represents is a dangerous blurring of the lines between the public and private sectors in a way that makes it difficult to tell where the American intelligence community ends and the IT sector begins. Two of the names that come up most often in connection with InQtel, however, need no introduction. Google and Facebook. The publicly available record on the Facebook InQtel connection is tenuous. Facebook received $12.7 million in venture capital from Excel, whose manager, James Breyer, now sits on their board. He was formerly the chairman of the National Venture Capital Association, whose board included Gilman Louie, then the CEO of InQtel. The connection is indirect, but the suggestion of CIA involvement with Facebook, however tangential, is disturbing in the light of Facebook's history of violating the privacy of its users. Around the time Facebook was launched, a similar government project was coming to an end. LifeLog was a project of the Information Processing Techniques Office of DARPA, designed, quote, to be able to trace the threads of an individual's life in terms of events, states, and relationships, with the ability to take in all of a subject's experiences from phone numbers dialed and email messages viewed to every breath taken, step made, and place gone. DARPA contractors stated that LifeLog software, quote, will be able to find meaningful patterns in the timetable to infer the user's routines, habits, and relationships with other people, organizations, places, and objects. Ultimately, the project was abandoned amid the same fears that rejected the Total Information Awareness Program and the Patriot Act II. Is it correct that when John Poindexter's program, Operation Total Information Awareness, was closed, that several of Mr. Poindexter's projects were moved to various intelligence agencies? I, I don't know the answer to that question. Do any of the other panel members know? This, the press has reported intelligence officials saying that those programs run by Mr. Poindexter, I and others on this panel led the effort to close it. We want to know if Mr. Poindexter's programs are going on somewhere else. Can anyone answer that? Mr. Muller? I have no knowledge of that, sir. Any other panel members? Senator, I'd like to answer you in closed session. That was Michael Hayden, the former head of the NSA, saying he'd like to answer in closed session, being questioned by Oregon's Senator Ron Wyden. Does this mean that the CIA and DARPA created Facebook? No, not necessarily, but it does show the similarity between these products and it should put a sense of caution in all social media users. And to be honest, governments already mine social media for all of your data anyways. Last summer, the NSA director was at a conference and he was asked a question about the NSA surveillance of Americans. He replied, and I quote here, the story that we have millions or hundreds of millions of dossiers on people is completely false. So what I wanted to see is if you could give me a yes or no answer to the question, does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? No, sir. It does not? Not wittingly. There are cases where they could in inadvertently perhaps uh, collect, but not, not wittingly. All right. In the end, we the people may have already handed the government and their partners in private industry all the information they need to control us, study us, and manipulate the masses. For one reason or another, most of the public has rejected military-developed, government-run spying platforms in favor of similar systems designed by corporations who are happy to share their information. Whether we are speaking about government surveillance and invasions of privacy, corporate spying and intrusion, or voluntary self-reporting of private information, we cannot ignore the fact that we are living in a state of complete and perpetual surveillance. We must ask ourselves what, if anything, privacy is going to mean for the coming generations who are being born into a world where surveillance is normalized and privacy is a relic of a long past era. Will you stand up for your right to be free from search, questioning, monitoring, and molestation? Or will you stand by and do nothing as the last signs of privacy and freedom are stripped away from us? The choice is yours. Thank you for watching. This is The Conscious Resistance with Derek Brose.